Dr. Jay Wartman is a native Canadian who really became concerned at the ill health of his own population when they were introduced to the industrialized North American diet. He discovered that he had type 2 diabetes, which he reversed completely by going on the low carbohydrate diet. And then he introduced that diet to his own population, his own people. In this talk, he will discuss the role of the low carbohydrate diet in the management of obesity, insulin resistance, and the metabolic syndrome. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's my first visit to South Africa, and I hope it won't be my last. I've had a wonderful visit so far. I cannot say enough about the hospitality and warmth with which we've been received here. I speak for all the visitors that have come. You've really set the bar very high in terms of how well you've treated us. Um, <clears throat> I come from the Northern Hemisphere where we're in the middle of winter and I live in a rainforest where you hardly ever see the sun. So I got too greedy and I went out on Camps Bay in my first day and I got completely scorched. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, according to Zoe, I've improved my cardiovascular disease risk with all this <laughs> vitamin D, but I think I increased my melanoma risk at the same time. Um, and this is a photograph of where I usually am this time of year with my kids uh, in the mountains skiing. The title of my talk is The Low Carb High Fat Diet for Obesity, Metabolic Syndrome, and Type 2 Diabetes. But I already listened to Gary Taubes and Eric Westman and a few other people, and I went back to my room last night and took out most of the slides that relate to that topic. Because you're hearing it already, and you're, you're gonna hear it many times, I think, during the next two days. And I, you know, like most of my other uh, speaker colleagues, I'm usually in an audience that's, if it's not outright hostile, it's semi-hostile. And my mission is within 45 minutes to convince them that basically everything they thought they knew about nutrition was actually wrong. And you're gonna get that over and over again because we're all used to doing that. So I thought I would change my slides a little bit uh, for the benefit of your attention. So men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. <laughs> I observe that in, among my colleagues a lot, not the ones that are with us today, but other colleagues. We have a health system that doesn't care about nutrition and a food system that doesn't care about health. And here are some of the culprits. These are the major corporations that own most of the brands that you and I are familiar with. And when you actually look carefully at this, which you can't really do because it's too small and busy, all, virtually all these brands represent foods that are comprised of three major ingredients. Refined grain, sugar, and seed oils. The combination of which I think are incredibly toxic and which are driving the epidemics of chronic disease that the world is experiencing now. I'm gonna to talk to you about, I'm gonna take you on a little journey. Uh, part, part of it is my own personal journey in discovering a low carb diet and how that happened, but also my journey into, uh, in the area, the part of the world I live, into the traditional diet of the indigenous people and what that has taught me as well. So I'm gonna show you, and in the course of this, and I've had a wonderful experience, I've become very fond of traditional food gathering. And here's an example of how we catch salmon on the northwest coast of North America. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is how we catch traditional food in general. Now, some people think exercise has something to do with the benefits of a traditional diet. Here's how we catch the salmon. At the river mouth, the bears catch only the tastiest, most tender salmon, which is exactly what we at John West want.
John West endure the worst to bring you the best. So traditional food gathering can be fun. Now, this is a picture of me. Uh, I grew up in the far north in Canada in the, where the sun doesn't shine most of the time in the winter, where the sun, it's light all day in the summer. Uh, temperatures drop to minus 40, minus 50 in the wintertime. And uh, it's a very tiny little community way up in the north on a big river. Uh, it was one of the first communities in Western Canada. It was part of the network of communities that were established to uh, uh, support the fur trade, which is how Canada first came about to be explored. Uh, the Hudson's Bay Company had fur trading posts stretching across northern Canada. And in fact, my grandfather was engaged in the fur trade. He went out as a young man. He went out and trapped fur-bearing animals in the wintertime, brought them home in the spring and traded them at the local fur trading post. And my grandmother's house was actually right next to that for that store, which was a general store, but it was where people traded furs. And this picture is of me taken about 40, well, no, 60 years ago, um, in front of my grandmother's house. The house is behind the camera. Uh, and I have fond recollections of growing up there and spending a lot of time in my grandmother's house. And my grandmother, being a matriarch in the community uh, and living next door to the, where the fur trading post was, uh, when the trappers would come into the community in the spring, having been out on the land all winter, would stop and have tea with grandma because she knew everything about everybody's business. And she, they could catch up on all the news of the winter. And I, and I recall being in her house, and by the way, here's her. I've got a picture of the house here. It, I went up there recently and uh, discovered that it had been restored and turned into a museum. And that's the house in which she raised nine children and heated with a wood stove in those bitterly cold winters. And I always remember her cooking things on that stove. She was baking uh, bread and uh, frying bread and making donuts and making cakes, and the whole house would fill with that smell. And as a little boy, that was quite exciting. But I also remember the trappers coming to visit and having tea with grandmother. And one occasion, I remember try th them trying to have an adult conversation, and I was getting underfoot. And the trapper reached into his backpack, and he pulled out a piece of dried moose meat smoked dried moose meat. And he gave that to me because that kept me busy for the next hour sitting in the corner chewing on that meat. And I, I, one of my fond m memories of childhood is how good that tasted. And just the way I remember how good the house smelled when grandma filled it up with all these odors of baking. And when I look back on it, it's an interesting uh, insight into how diet was changing in this small northern native community. My, my grandmother's family was all Métis, which is one of the aboriginal populations in Canada. And the men out on the land were still eating their traditional food like dried meat, and grandma was in town baking foods made from sugar and flour and vegetable oil. The diet was changing, and we paid a price. Both my grandparents developed type 2 diabetes and died from the complications. Of their nine children, they all developed type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease or both. The only surviving sibling of that family is my mother, who's in her 80s now, and she's had type 2 diabetes and breast cancer. And so we share that predisposition that indigenous populations seem to have for these diseases. And I was not spared from this. There are four children in my, my family, and three of us have developed type 2 diabetes. Now, I remember the day I figured out that I had type 2 diabetes. A lot of things happened between that last picture and this one. This is my house where I was living in Vancouver, West Vancouver in the rainforest uh, a few years ago, uh, 12 years ago, 12 and a half years ago. And I, I very distinctly remember being in my upstairs bathroom, and it actually wasn't a nice day. It was a cold, dreary, miserable, rainy winter day like it is there right now. And I was in the upstairs bathroom, and I was looking in the mirror thinking, you don't look so well. I had slowly developed the symptoms of type 2 diabetes. I had become fatigued. I had gained weight. Uh, um, I was getting up at night to urinate. I was urinating more frequency. I was thirsty all the time. My vision had become blurry. I was squinting at the TV during the evening news. And none of these things actually it caused me to suspect I had a problem. I just thought these are the natural and inevitable effects of aging. 
because I was getting older, just like we all are. And on that particular day in the bathroom in my home there, it suddenly came together to me, like, holy crap, you've got all the symptoms of type 2 diabetes, plus you've got a family history and a genetic predisposition. <laughs> Duh, you know? <laughs> what does it take? Uh, and it turned out I had some uh, urinary uh, test strips in the, in the cabinet, because, uh, long story, but I thought my cat had diabetes, but anyway. <clears throat> I actually was able to right then and there check my urine and of course the, the, the sugar was right off the chart. And one of the problems with being a doctor is you know too much. So I knew that my life expectancy now was shorter, that my risk of serious complications had gone way up. Cardiovascular disease, kidney failure, blindness, amputation. And I had a two-year-old son, my first child. And I thought, oh my God, my chances of growing old with him watching him grow and have children, has suddenly been severely limited. So it was a very profound shock to me, even though I should have seen it coming. And at that point in time, I had been away from clinical medicine for a while. I had worked in government and public health, and I had a, eventually got into a senior position with Health Canada. And so I'd been away from clinical medicine for a little while, and I thought, okay, I've got to figure out what, what I'm going to do about this. Last thing that occurred to me was to go to a doctor, right? Um, typical doctor. Uh, I thought, I'll buy, I need to buy myself some time to figure out essentially what's the, the best drug right now for this. And I knew enough about diabetes to know that uh, blood sugar, when blood sugar's high, that's not good, and carbohydrates make your blood sugar go up. So I thought, okay, I'll buy some time by right from this moment on not eating any carbohydrates. Now, I knew nothing about diet. I had the typical medical education. We get no training on nutrition. Uh, we're told, go send them to the nutritionist and they'll put them on the food guide, basically. Uh, and I had no knowledge of low-carb diet. And I had a wife who's a very, she worries about everything. So I, the last thing I wanted to do was cause her worry by telling her I discovered I had diabetes. So I surreptitiously stopped eating carbohydrates. <laughs> and, you know, my wife is not stupid. <laughs> It did not take her long to figure out something was going on. So after a couple of days, I confessed to her, okay, darling, this is what's happening, and, and, and this is why I'm not eating any carbohydrates. And she said, basically, uh, you're on the Atkins diet, dummy. And she had the Atkins book somewhere because after her child, she was trying to lose weight. She brought it home, and, and, and my, I told her what I'd been trained to say, uh, yeah, nobody can stay on those diets, sure, give it a try, but nobody can do that. So she dusted off this book and brought it out, and I had a quick read, and yeah, sure enough, I was on the Atkins diet. I knew nothing about it up until that point. So what, what happened over the next few days was I had basically a miraculous recovery. All the signs and symptoms went away quickly. Uh, my blood sugar normalized, and I started losing about a pound a day of weight, which went on for about a month. I lost over 30 pounds of weight. It just fell off me. My pants size shrunk and shrunk. In those days, I had to wear a suit to work. I had to take all my suits in, get them redone, and then again, had to go in and get them redone over the course of the month. So something very dramatic happened, and something that I had never encountered in my medical training or my years of medical practice. And I had done some additional training in diabetes because one of the first jobs I had out of medical training was I was the camp doctor at the children's diabetes camp for our province. I did that for four years. So I knew diabetes, type 1 diabetes, but also type 2. I knew how to manage it. I knew about the diet. I knew uh, everything you really needed to know at that point to be a good doctor, except how to prevent it in myself, of course. So I was curious about this. This had worked brilliantly for me. Why had I never seen it anywhere in my training or my practice? And that set me on a different path. And from that point on, my career took a different path and my health took a different path. Okay, I'm gonna tell you another story now. This is a story about Ulican Greece. Who's heard about Ulican Greece? How, how did you hear about Ulican Greece? <laughs> this is South Africa, for crying out loud. Okay, some of you already know the story. This is the Nass River Valley in northern British Columbia. It's a beautiful northern uh, geography there. It's a big river valley in the mountains that runs westward 
uh, and the river hits the Pacific Ocean right at the tip of the Alaska Panhandle. And it's the home of the Niska First Nations, a very strong, resilient uh, Aboriginal population who lives in five villages along this valley and have lived there for thousands of years. The valley's full of volcanic rubble, lava. There was a volcanic eruption there a couple hundred years ago that killed many of the Niska people at the time and filled this valley with the, the, the volcanic lava. So it's a beauti stunningly beautiful uh, geography. On the other side of those mountains is Alaska, and that's a totem pole we encountered along the way. And we included uh, Dr. Finney, who you're going to hear from later, who had joined me for a trip up there <coughs> to look at the ulican fish and the ulican harvest. The ulican fish is a small, smelt-like fish that has been harvested in the rivers there for millennia. People, people think it's gone back as far as 9,000 years, the traditional harvest of this little fish that comes up the river in the springtime in great, great volumes, changes the color of the water. It's one of these force of nature events. It's after the ice first leaves the river that all the predatory birds fly around in great big mobs. Uh, predatory fish follow them and predatory sea mammals and so on. So there's all these stuff going on when the Ulican run happens. And they're so plentiful that people in the, you can see this archival photograph, they just dipped them out of the water and filled up their uh, cedar canoes, canoes with this fish. Here's another picture of a canoe full of the fish. Here's a, a Ulican camp. The whole village would move down to the Ulican grounds for this this time of year, and those are big racks of ulican that are drying in the sun. They've threaded them onto long strips of cedar bark. But most importantly, what they did with the ulican fish was they fermented it. And in the right lower corner there, you see a bin, a big uh, wooden bin full of tons of ulican fish sitting there uh, slowly fermenting. Here's another picture of a bin of ulican fish fermenting uh, in the ambient temperature. And then what they do is they transfer the, after the fish are fermented for a couple of weeks, they transfer this into these big wooden boxes. <clears throat> and in the old days, they heated rocks in a fire and transferred the rocks into the boxes to bring, bring the temperature of this mixture of grease, of, sorry, of fish and water up to a simmering point. And they tended it and simmered it for hours and hours. It was an around the clock thing. Here's a modern ulican fishery. We were out, out on these boats with these men. They're using different kinds of nets. And unfortunately, the ulican fish is dwindling. The supplies are dwindling. They weren't catching too many that day. There's my little son who was with me on the trip. And here's the ulican camp where the big bin is inside that shed. And now they have a metal plate underneath and they use propane to light the fire. And so it's a little bit modernized, but the idea is still the same and they, they gently simmer this concoction for hours and hours, gently stirring it with paddles. And then when they reach a certain point, they stop, they put out the fire, and they let it slowly return to ambient temperature, stirring it constantly, and they end up with this layer of fat. This little fish is about 30% fat, and they extract that fat, filter it and put it in, into containers. In the old days, they put them into these really beautifully built watertight wooden boxes. But nowadays, they put them in jars. And we, we discovered that this food was a highly valued staple food in this population. It was used both as a condiment and a medicinal. Uh, it accounted for, in our estimation, about 25% of the calories of the modern participants in this fishery. Excuse me, I scorched my larynx in the sun <laughs> the other day as well. Uh, not only was it used locally, but it was a highly valued trade item. And as far back as people could remember, it was traded inland to the populations that didn't have access to the sea. And there were uh, early explorer accounts of men uh, uh, heading west through the mountains, encountering whole villages, trekking up through the mountains with boxes of ulican grease. Every man, every woman, child, dog, were carrying boxes of ulican grease to go inland to trade for other goods. And they established these trails through the mountains over hundreds and over centuries, and they were called grease trails. And in 1793, when Alexander Mackenzie made the first recorded crossing of the North American continent, he actually followed a grease trail for the last 350 kilometers down to the Pacific Ocean. Here's an archival picture of a potlatch ceremony 
where in a community there's a big celebration of giving things away. And on the right there, I don't know if you can see it too clearly, but those are, those are jugs of lilikan grease there to be given away during the potlatch. So Dr. Finney and I were quite intrigued with this. The question we had was why? Why did they do this? During a modern day ulikin harvest, there's a tremendous amount of work involved to do this with modern technology and boats and nets and propane fires and so on. But in the old days, they did it every year. It, the, the whole village would relocate. Every family had their Mulican camp along the seashore, or, or, or sorry, the river, and they spent months there doing this. And they're surrounded by other sources of fat. They don't eat a high carb diet. There's very little carb in their diet. It's a high fat diet. But there's lots of other sources of fat. There's fatty fish like salmon. Uh, there's fatty land mammals. There's fatty sea mammals. They had uh, sea lions, whales all kinds of sources of fat. What, why in the world did they pick that one little fish to go to all that trouble to extract that fat out of that little fish? This was a really interesting question. Now, I'm not gonna tell you the answer until the end, just so you pay attention. We think we know the answer. I've spent a lot of time looking at traditional diets and particularly in North America, where I've had the privilege of traveling extensively in the North. And it strikes me that in every instance where I uh, learn about a traditional diet, there is a central fat. These diets tend to be low in carbohydrate and high in fat. Coast Salish, the people I told you about, Ulik and Greece. Uh, you go up further north, it's bear fat and moose fat. I remember being in a man's home in the far north, having dinner with his family, and on the table was some moose meat and uh, some salmon. The salmon run up the river all the way up to, to where he lives. And then there was a big tub of rendered bear fat. And you took the bear fat and you smeared it on the meat and on the fish as you ate it. And they do the same with moose fat. The Inuit are famous for whale fat, rendering whale fat and carrying it around in bags and dipping other foods in it. Plains First Nations were fa famous for the pemmican, buffalo fat, and protein mixed together, ratio of about 85% fat to 15% protein. And they, they thrived on that, on a diet basically of that plus maybe a few berries. In the east coast of Canada, the Innu people rendered caribou fat, dried it, had it like a powder, and then they would reconstitute it into a slurry and eat that. One of my uh, Innu medical colleagues Actually, when he was in university, he was so poor in Montreal, his family was sending him this, and this is what he lived on when he was in studying medicine. And I've been down in Australia and have some Aborigine friends who've taken me out on the land and explained to me how they cook kangaroo to preserve the fat and how emu fat is a highly valued food and medicinal, somewhat like ulic and grease. In this, one of these little villages on the coast in the north, one of the elders took us into his home. This is Steve Finney and me and brought out his traditional food supply and showed us what they ate. And this is modern times. So this big dark mass there is dried seaweed. That's the only vegetable matter on the table. Uh, you can see in the bag there, uh, the plastic bag, that's sun-dried halibut. And then a big, a big piece of salmon that's been smoked and dried. These are ulican fish that have been sun-dried and they're on a strip of uh, cedar bark. That big jar is sea lion that's been smoked and canned, and you can see it's quite fatty. We had some in the dish in the bowl there. We were sampling it. There's that stick there is devil's club, and they make a broth out of the bark, and I'm not sure completely why. Someone said it's because it takes away your scent, and it made you a better hunter. I'm not sure what the truth is. And then there are some jars there of berries, canned berries. And of course, modern day canning involves putting sugar in there. In the old days, they didn't have sugar. What, what I'm told they did in the old days, well, certainly they dried berries, but they also mixed them with ulican grease. And that's what you see in the, in the jar there, is ulican grease, and we had some in the bowl because we're dipping the other foods in the ulican grease as we sampled it. So what's missing from here? Well, land mammals. They hunt land mammals as well as sea mammals. But the main thing that's missing from here is any significant source of carbohydrate. So these people ate a low-carb, high-fat diet. And now, this is what they eat. 
These are pictures Eric Westman actually took in one of the villages where we did a, a study in the store. But you go into a store in any of these little towns, and this is what you see on the store shelves, and this is what you find people have in their cupboards at home. They've shifted from a diet of low carb, high fat, moderate protein, to a diet now that is majority of, it's majority a, a high carb diet and the worst possible kind of carbohydrates. So it isn't, is it any wonder that they are leading the epidemics of chronic disease, of obesity, metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes, and so on. It's a tragedy actually of how this diet change has occurred over a very short period of time and has had a tremendous negative effect on this population. So we designed a study. <clears throat> we approached a small community. Um, at this point, I had hooked up with Eric Westman, Steve Finney, Mary Vernon, and uh, we, we put together, a, I, I approached the Canadian government, I was working in Health Canada at the time, and convinced them that we should try something different because what we're doing right now wasn't working very well, and it was costing a lot of money, and that's what they're mainly concerned about. So they gave us some money to conduct a study, and we went into a small community, uh, First Nations community, and we said, we think the change from your traditional diet to what you eat now is what's making you overweight and sick. And we think if you went back to eat your traditional diet, these things may get better. And since everybody can't eat all the traditional foods anymore, they're not necessarily available, maybe you don't necessarily want to, you can add in market foods to your traditional diet as long as they don't have starch or sugar. So basically we put these people on a low carb ketogenic diet and they did well. They lost weight, they improved their metabolic markers, they uh, got off their medications, they felt better, they, they're psychologically uh, happier, uh, whole, just a whole range of things happen in this small community. And the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation uh, was interested in what we were doing and had, had a documentary film crew following us around for a year, and they made a lovely documentary film about this called My Big Fat Diet, and uh, they or the producers probably don't want me to tell you this, but you can actually find it on YouTube. And I would encourage you to do that. My Big Fat Diet. Now, we've, Eric's touched on this a little bit, but one of the things that strikes me about our chronic disease epidemics right now is that what we're talking about aren't a bunch of distinct and different diseases. We're talking about a problem that is linked together in one huge epidemic of chronic disease. And what I look at as the sort of successive waves of this are these things, overweight and obesity, metabolic syndrome, I'll talk about that in a minute, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke. Those things appear to me to be a continuum. We make some artificial boundaries. We say, you know, if your hemoglobin A1C is this, you're pre-diabetic or you're, you're normal, then if it's this a little bit more, you're pre-diabetic, and oh, now it's this number, you're diabetic. Well, those are artificial distinctions. What we have is a continuum of disease, the underpinning of which appears to be insulin resistance. So you start with an incipient, silent insulin resistance that slowly creeps up on you, and then you find yourself going down this path of obesity, overweight, metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Now, this is not my original idea. Uh, there's this very bright man in Australia, Paul Zimmet. He's one of the world's leading diabetologists. He published an article in, this is 2000, talking about this very idea that type two diabetes is just the tip of the iceberg. The iceberg is metabolic syndrome. And here he shows you what that is. It's a constellation of things, insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, central obesity, that means belly fat, dyslipidemia, problem with your cholesterol, and blood, high blood pressure. And we recognize that the thing that binds that together is insulin resistance. And I would add, there's a bigger part of the uh, iceberg underneath that one, and that is the obesity epidemic. That seems to be the first thing, the first wave of the chronic disease problem. Now, we also know that there are a whole bunch of other things associated with this. If you were here yesterday, Gary Tubbs, did a better job of listing them, but here are some of the things that we know. If you have insulin resistance, you're at higher risk of having these other chronic disease problems. Fatty liver, small dense LDL, which is the one that, as Eric pointed out, is the atherogenic uh, uh, cholesterol particle. Oxidative stress, think about free radicals, you've got too much of that. Inflammation, 
hypercoagulability. That's why some of you are taking small aspirin. Uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, a female manifestation of insulin resistance. Uh, acid reflux, sleep apnea, asthma, depression, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, cancers. There's a whole list of things now. Uh, and it grows. When metabolic syndrome was first described, Gerald Reven was the one who did the initial work. And he described it. the basic defect, he called it syndrome X, We're, we've changed the name, uh, is resistance to insulin-mediated glucose disposal. So he right away it recognized that the underpinning of this was insulin resistance. If dietary carbohydrate is increased in an isocaloric diet, additional insulin must be secreted to maintain glucose homo homeostasis. So what he's also saying is that when you develop insulin resistance, to maintain a normal blood sugar in that uh, circumstance, your body has to produce more insulin. So insulin resistance goes hand in hand with hyperinsulinemia. Dr. Jason Fung is going to give you a much more in-depth uh, review of what that means uh, sometime soon here. Now, this is some work done by uh, some of my colleagues in Hamilton, Ontario. They published a paper on basically what is the natural course of insulin resistance. So on the left-hand side, you have uh, beta cell function. In other words, the capacity of the pancreas to produce insulin. On the bottom, you have scale in years. And that zero point is where you're diagnosed with diabetes, okay? And what they showed that is that if you'd gone back 12 years earlier and looked really hard, you could pick up the early signs of insulin resistance. And also that as soon as insulin resistance develops, you start to lose beta cell capacity. In other words, your ability to produce insulin starts to go down while your pancreas is actually producing excess insulin to uh, control blood sugar in the face of the insulin resistance. And that this is an inexorable decline. It just, it goes down and down and down. And those yellow dots there are uh, indications of what we do. We start throwing drugs and insulin at the problem, but it doesn't really solve the problem because the beta cell loss keeps keeps on going. So essentially, we're treating the symptoms, not the underlying cause. And here's how we do this. We, we load up a shotgun with medication. Uh, what I've listed here are the classes of drugs, not just the individual drugs, the classes of drugs used to treat metabolic syndrome type 2 diabetes. There are, I think, about 25 classes of drugs, multiple drugs in each class. So there's a lot of polypharmacy, and a lot of money involved in managing these problems. So let's look at the epidemic themselves. And we've got really good data on the epidemic of obesity, which I think is the front runner of the other chronic disease epidemics. And the American Center for Disease Control publishes these wonderful maps that show obesity as it has developed over the US, across the US over the last a uh, couple of decades, this starting in 1985. And the uh, lighter blue uh, states are reporting obesity rates of under 10%, and the darker blue is 10 to 14%, and the, <coughs> the dark green ones are not reporting yet. But over time, more states start reporting, and you can see that the color starts to change as well, and that the number of states with 10 to 14% is increasing to the point where in 1991 we have to add a new category, uh, 15 to 19%. And that is starting to increase and spread across the states. And then in 1997 we add a new category, more than 20% obesity. And that starts to spread across. And then in 2001 we have to add a new category, more than 25% obesity. And that starts to spread. And you'll notice that it's always the same states that are leading the, the epidemic there. Now, I don't know if you follow American politics, but those were the states that elected George Bush. <laughs> now, another, another category had to be added uh, more than 30%. And that one, like the others, continues to spread across the states. So something happened in recent memory that we could actually track. We watched an, epi ep an epidemic sweep across a continent inexorably from east to west over a short period of time. 
Here's another way of looking at this. Eric gave me this slide a long time ago. Uh, this is a line graph showing that the epidemic really started at a certain point in time. So when something happened, and you know when it happened, you're in a really good position to figure out why it happened, because you need to look around that point of time, before that point of time, to find out what changed. What changed that could have caused that sudden acceleration of an epidemic like that? This is a, a chart showing type 2 diabetes in the US. And it's followed the same trajectory as an epidemic. 12 years later, you can see the time frame is 12 years later, which, which fits nicely with that earlier chart I showed you, where if you look from type 2 diabetes back 12 years, you, you've got that much time of insulin resistance accumulating. Insulin resistance causes obesity. So why? What, what happened? What caused this? Well, we know. We got the answer. All the experts in the world agree that it's because people eat too much and exercise too little. And that makes them fat. And when they get fat, they develop metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or both. And, it, and there's really consensus agreement everywhere. Gary mentioned it yesterday, the WHO, energy, in, energy imbalance <coughs> between calories we consume and ones we expend. CDC in the States, weight management's all about balance. UK, uh, the imbalance between energy in, energy out. Everybody agrees, okay? Problem solved, right? So we base our prevention on that paradigm, that understanding of why this happened. So we've asked people to exercise more, control their diet, eat, eat less, exercise more, <laughs> stay away from the junk food, and exercise some more. <laughs> and we've poured billions of dollars into this kind of prevention for decades. And we've gone from there to there to there to there during that time. This pretty much sums up our success. <laughs> it has not worked. <clears throat> it has not worked. And in any other field of endeavor, if you're trying to shoot a rocket to the moon or if you're trying to build a computer, if you try and you try and you try and you don't get the result you need, you don't keep trying. You go back to your basic paradigm and ask questions. Did we get this right? Why is this not working? What are we doing wrong? And for some reason, in the field of nutritional science, we don't do that. We keep trying harder. We keep flogging and flogging this poor dead beast. Well, we know exercise is supposed to fix it, right? It just makes sense. Because if you exercise, you burn off calories. You burn off calories, got to come from your fat tissue, you get slimmer. Here was a paper by Resterturp published uh, four, five years ago. An exercise-induced increase in energy requirement is typically compensated by an increased energy intake. What? What he's saying is, and this is a review of the literature, when you exercise, you eat more. You don't lose weight from exercise, and the literature is pretty clear on that. There's a number of studies now showing that exercise is a poor strategy for weight loss. And here he is explaining that it's because when you exercise, you get hungry and you eat more. You compensate for the calories you burn. Now, here's the real Nobel Prize winning observation. When you eat more, it doesn't make you exercise. Overeating does not affect physical activity. <laughs> Too bad, huh? And then, then this is the cognitive dissonance that you find wherever you go in the literature on this topic. He says, there are two ways in which the general population trend towards increasing body weight can be reversed. Reduce intake or increase physical activity in the same paper. Explains why it doesn't work and then recommends that that's what we do. Well, we know that, okay, exercise is not going to solve this. Fat in our diet, that is the problem. We know it's fat. Eat, you eat fat, you get fat. It just makes common sense. And, and we know that fat has more calories per gram. It's nine calories per gram of fat versus four calories per gram of protein or carbohydrate. So obviously, if you stop eating fat or if you eat a low-fat diet, fat will make you slim. 
Well, Walter Willett at Harvard did this meta-analysis where he gathered up the studies that looked at population fat consumption and population obesity rates. And what he found was across a wide range of fat intake from 25% to 47% of the diet, that there was no correlation to population body weight. And he covered China, Europe, all over the world. And in one instance in the European studies, he actually found among women, there was an inverse relationship. Those French women that eat all the butter and brie were the thinnest. He concludes, diets high in fat are not the primary cause of the high prevalence of excess body fat in our society. And reduction in fat is not the answer. He goes on to say, exercise is the answer. <laughs> oh dear. So here is, uh, this is American food supply data. They publish this online, the American Department of uh, Agriculture has all this data. So this is raw, unrefined, unmanipulated, just plain data <coughs> on macronutrient per gram per capita per day in the US, starting in 1950 to 2006. And the red line is the amount of fat in the US food supply. And the big red arrow is that point where the epidemic takes off. I don't see an increase in fat consumption anywhere around that time. Can't be fat consumption that's driving the fat epidemic. Now, saturated fat is there as well. And you notice it hasn't increased either. Now, saturated fat is a special case. It's not that it makes you fat, it's that it clogs your arteries. We're supposed to avoid that one because it's like cold bacon fat going down, or sorry, hot bacon fat going down the cold kitchen drain. You're not supposed to do that because it clogs the drain, right? <coughs> you eat those bacon with your eggs and it clogs your arteries with that fat. Or so they say. So uh, this is a meta-analysis and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this one. It caused a bit of a splash uh, four years ago, five years ago when it was published, where uh, some researchers gathered together 21 large prospective epidemiological studies that looked at the relationship of saturated fat and any form of arterial disease, heart disease, stroke. And what they found, and, and these studies were significant, they ranged in length from five to 23 years, and the total pool of subjects was 350,000. So when they pool all that data, they've got a lot to work with, they reanalyze it all, and guess what? They could find no relationship between saturated fat intake and the risk of heart disease and stroke. Now that's an observational study, and the smart scientists out here know that you cannot draw conclusions from observational data. You have to have a clinical trial. This is one of the problems in nutritional science is that we frequently, in fact most of the time, take observational data and leap over that necessary next step of a clinical trial. We don't do that and we end up making policy based and recommendations based on observational data, which is why we get it wrong so many times. And that necessary step of clinical trial is skipped because it's very hard to do, and it's expensive, and it takes a long time. And when you have something you like from your observational data, it's very tempting to say, oh, okay, uh, red meat causes death. Okay, let's make that a policy without actually doing the trial. This is what uh, uh, Zoe Harcombe talked about yesterday in her study that was published recently, where she showed that there were no trials that supported the food guide recommendations that were made in 1977, 1983. They leapt from observational data right into recommendations. Well, fortunately, in this case, we have a clinical trial. Hmm. So sorry about that. Here we go. It's actually gin. I lied. It's not tea. <laughs> There's the Women's Health Initiative. Now this is the moonshot of nutritional clinical trials. They spent, they admit to spending over half a billion US dollars on this study. And many people tell me it was closer to a billion. They had a huge cohort, 50,000 postmenopausal women, divided, randomized into two groups. One group intensively counseled to stop eating fat. The other group pretty much let to go, so there's a uh, uh, intervention bias built in all right away. And even with that intervention bias, after 8.1 years of observation, they could not show a benefit for heart disease, breast cancer, weight 
a uh, couple other things, cardiovascular stroke. So the randomized controlled trial actually proved out the, the results of the observational study, that they could not make a connection between saturated fat and these other problems. Now, Ron Krauss, who wrote this commentary, is a lipidologist based in San Francisco, very mainstream guy on the American Heart Association Nutrition Committee, uh, somebody who's very conscious about the dangers of investigating some of these things and coming to the wrong conclusion, in other words, the right conclusion, uh, started publishing some studies on small, dense LDL. He's the one, probably the main proponent of this concept that it's not just your LDL cholesterol, your bad cholesterol, it's the quality of the bad cholesterol because you need it. You can't all be bad. Uh, if you didn't have any, you'd be dead, right? So you need LDL. It turns out that it's the particle size of the LDL that's important, and small, dense LDL is the one that's implicated in cardiovascular disease risk. And he was curious about, well, what drives L small, dense LDL? We know saturated fat's supposed to kill us, so he's investigating that. On this chart, on the left, the purple bar is the large, healthy LDL, and the, on the other side, the, the turquoise colored bar is the small, dense, harmful LDL, and the others are the intermediate ones. So on the first set of bars, he's feeding this group of people a standard diet of 54% carbohydrates. Then he reduces the carbohydrates to 39%. That is not a low-carb diet. That's a very modest reduction in carbohydrates. But look what happened to the LDL particle size. It shifted in a healthy direction. Reduced amount of small, dense LDL, slight improvement in large LDL. Then he dropped it to 26%, which is half. Still not what I call a low-carb diet, but tremendous improvement in the particle size of LDL. Then what he did was he swapped out the fats and added in saturated fat, the evil fat that's supposed to cause heart disease. And in the last set of bars, you see that not only did things not get worse with saturated fat, they actually got better. That the improvement in particle size was even greater with added saturated fat to the lower, the reduced carb intervention. So what he's been showing, and he's done a number of studies now, is that it's not saturated fat that's driving the atherogenic cholesterol problem. It's the carbohydrate component of the diet. And if anything, saturated fat's actually making it better. His reward for fi figuring that out is that he finds it very difficult to get his research funded now. Uh, so, we know, so it wasn't fat that caused this problem. And there's only three macronutrients, fat, protein, and carbohydrate. So let's look at protein. Here's the protein data in the American food supply. The blue line there, no change there, okay? Let's look at carbohydrate. Well, this is the only one that actually changed. And it started to change pretty much right around when the epidemic took off, and it coincides with the introduction of the first food guide in 1977, which recommended that people increase their carbohydrate intake in the form of all these healthy whole grains and so on. And sugar increased. That's the, the, the different type of graph, but showing you sugar con consumption in the US over time. And <clears throat> you can see where the epidemic starts, the dietary guidelines came out, sugar uh, rose sharply from that point on. So eating too much, exercising too little makes you fat. These are my pre and post photos. Uh, <laughs> if you're at Camp Bay on Wednesday, you know I don't wear a bathing suit like that. I'm just joking, I wear a thong. Uh, <laughs> but this is how we explain why the lateral dimension of these two men is different. That the guy with the big bell belly ate too many calories and didn't burn off enough. And the other guy, ate the right amount of calories and burned off the same amount that he ate. That's how we explain it. Does eating too much and exercising too little make you tall? How do we explain these guys? Andreas used to have dark hair, as you can see. Yeah. Um, where are you, Andreas? I'm sorry, I apologize. The, who, which one of these two guys eats more? It's not a trick question. The big guy eats more. Is that why he's big? No. Is the little guy small because he starved himself? No. We would never in a million years think that. We know 
right away that there's a hormonal problem that caused their extremes. And that the big guy grew tall, he had to eat a lot to get that tall, but that's not why he got that tall. There was a hormonal imperative driving that growth, causing him to eat more to feed that growth. So hormones are involved. Maybe it's not the calories in, calories out. Maybe there's something else going on. Maybe it's a little bit more complicated. Maybe it's got something to do with hormones. So the first hormone is one you know about, insulin. The title of this slide is Simplified Depiction of Insulin Action. <laughs> and there'll be an exam at the end. Now, uh, Eric gave away my surprise. I was going to ask you how much sugar is there in the blood. Uh, think about it, though. <clears throat> you have one teaspoon. I, in my blood supply, I don't know how much Eric has in his. He said seven. But in mine, I have four grams of sugar in my entire blood supply. If I have one gram in excess, over time, that harms me. Your body knows that. Sugar is toxic when it gets out of that normal range. Your body goes to extraordinary lengths to keep it in that normal range. One level teaspoon. Now when you eat a banana, there's five teaspoons. If you eat a, a waffle and some pancakes and a, a banana with some yogurt and some maple syrup, that's what I used to eat for breakfast when I was a vegetarian. <laughs> How many teaspoons of sugar do you flood into your system all at once? It's a huge amount when you're eating a high carb diet. And your body is in a constant state of metabolic emergency trying to dispose of all this toxic stuff before it harms you. And insulin is secreted in large quantities because it's the thing, it's the agent that is meant to do that. So it does a number of things. It pushes fat out of the way and puts glucose in front of the queue to be burned because burning it off is one way of getting rid of it. Now our brilliant nutritional scientists make this observation. Oh, the cell has all these fuels available and it seems to always burn glucose. Therefore, it must like glucose. So therefore, we should recommend glucose as the preferred fuel. And therefore, you should eat a lot of carbohydrates because your body wants glucose. Completely missing the point that the body isn't burning it because it likes it. It's burning it because it's desperate to get rid of it because it's toxic. You see how we got this wrong? So insulin pushes fat away, inserts glucose in to be burned off. In the liver, insulin takes the excess glucose in the blood and turns it into fat. And it populates those small dense LDL particles, for instance. And at the fat cell, and Gary talked about this yesterday, insulin creates a one-way door. The fat goes into the fat cell and can't get back out. Now remember, if you have insulin resistance, even early on in your insulin resistance, you produce excess insulin. So when you start to produce excess insulin, you accelerate these things that are going on with the insulin and the glucose and the fat, and you become very efficient fat storers, and you become, it becomes very difficult to get the fat out to burn it because your insulin levels are constantly getting higher and higher because your insulin resistance is getting worse and worse. So <clears throat> the second hormone is leptin. Now leptin's job it does a number of things, but the main job leptin does is it's a messenger from your fat tissue to your brain. It takes you to your brain the message, your fat tissue is expanding, you can stop eating, please. The bathtub's overflowing, you can turn off the tap. So when the fat tissue is expanding, you get a big leptin signal going to the brain. So that person with insulin resistance, their fat tissue is expanding. They've got high insulin levels promoting fat storage. And you would expect they would have a big leptin signal signaling to the brain to stop, you know, turn it off. <coughs> and as it turns out, they do have a big leptin signal. The problem is that it doesn't get to the brain. And you probably heard of Robert Lustig for his famous uh, YouTube video, Sugar the Bitter Truth. He actually did publish a paper talking about this. So they, he's done a lot of work on uh, this where he argues that the reason that signal does not get to the brain and these overweight insulin resistance people continue to eat 
like the slide Eric showed of the very fat man who says he's always hungry, is because insulin in, acts as an antagonist to leptin. So that high level of insulin that's causing the fat storage and which drives the, the high leptin signal, that high level of insulin also intercepts that like leptin signal and it doesn't get to the brain. Now this is where the interesting thing is, all animals react the same way. When they don't get a leptin signal, the brain interprets that to mean that you're starving. And when animals starve, they do two things. They seek food and they conserve energy. So that overweight, insulin-resistant patient who sits on the sofa all day and watches TV and only exercises frequent trips to the kitchen is actually responding to this very primitive survival signal telling them that they are, their survival depends on not using any energy that they don't have to use and that they need to store, get as much food as they can. And our prescription, based on our the conventional paradigm for this problem is get your sorry butt off the sofa and go jogging and stay away from the fridge. Now, some people can, through tremendous effort of will, overpower those primitive and very intense survival signals telling them to do the exact opposite, but most people fail. It's very hard to do. So, this is our paradigm, increase calories, Decreased activity makes you fat. Well, we got the essentials right, we got the arrow wrong. Being fat causes you to eat more and exercise less because you've got this metabolic dysregulation of the hormones, insulin and leptin, which is driven by dietary carbohydrates. So this par in this paradigm, it's not about calories. It's about which food group you eat, the carbohydrate foods, which drive this dysfunctional metabolic pathway. So in my paradigm and the one we all discuss and support here at this meeting, the target for our intervention isn't calories, it's carbohydrates. Stop eating the carbohydrates and these down thing, downstream things unwind. And that's what the studies show us. When you do studies, people lose weight, they correct their insulin and leptin resistance, they normalize their blood sugar, they normalize their blood pressure, cholesterol gets better, they reduce inflammation, oxidative stress goes down, a whole bunch of things improve. Now Jeff Volek <clears throat> does good studies and it's a pity he wasn't able to join us. He, he would have been an important part of the team here if, if he was able to come. He does really good quality studies and there's a lot of crappy quality studies out there done by people who really don't understand a low-carb diet. Often they're done to, to disprove the benefits of a low-carb diet. Jeff knows what he's doing. He does very, very tightly controlled studies. So here's one where he took 40 people with metabolic syndrome, put them on the recommended low-fat diet plus the other group on this diet. 12 weeks, they both ate the same amount of calories. Here's the diet composition. The yellow bars are the low-carb, high-fat diet. You can see the fat is much higher. Also that the saturated fat, there's triple the amount of saturated fat, half the fiber oh my God, you're gonna die if you eat that. Well, here's the results. The low carb diet lost twice as much weight. When they did DEXA scans, more of the weight was fat and more of the weight, they, they doubled the loss of abdominal fat. This is the metabolically bad fat around the waist that's part of the metabolic syndrome. They improved their insulin resistance and their leptin resistance to a far greater degree on this diet. Their lipid profile, got better across the board, uh, much better compared to the other diet. And they followed 14 inflammatory markers and got a, an overall much greater improvement in reducing inflammation. Now, one of the problems with the low-carb diet research is that you're confounded by the fact that you lose weight. So it's hard to tease out, did the reduction in carbs cause the benefit or was it the benefit of losing weight and you would have benefited no matter how you lost the weight? Well, Gannon and Nuttall in uh, Wisconsin, no, Minnesota, have been looking at this question. And they've designed studies where they feed people a low carb diet or reducing the amount of carbs without weight loss. And I'm not exactly sure how they do that because it's hard to maintain your weight when you stop eating carbs. But we, they've tried to tease out that variable of weight loss to show 
that the carbs themselves give you benefit. And, what, and, and they're smart, right? Because it's very hard to get funded to study low carb diet. They invented low bag diet. Low biologically available glucose. Wink, wink, you know? <laughs> smart, really smart. And they got funded to do these studies. And what they showed was, th this is a series of studies where they went low bag 40, 40 grams of carb, 30, 20, no, sorry, percent carb, 40 percent, 30, 20. And they showed this is hemoglobin A1C improvements over a five week period. Look at that incredible improvement on hemoglobin A1C with no weight loss, just carb reduction. And here they compare it to the weight loss I'm sorry, the, the hemoglobin A1C improvement you get with Avandia or metformin. Their diet blows those drugs out of the water in terms of improvement. Now here's a famous study by the famous Dr. Eric Westman uh, compared to another study by Dr. Jenkins. Jenkins invented the GI index. He's based at the University of Toronto. Uh, <clears throat> the first two bars are Jenkins comparing his low GI diet to uh, a more moderate diet for the control of diabetes, kind of the recommended diet. And what he's shown is that weight, hemoglobin A1C, glucose, lipids, all improve if you go from the recommended diet to a low GI diet. And based on that one study, the Canadian Diabetes Association new guideline now endorses a low GI diet for the management of type 2 diabetes. Along comes this troublemaker, Eric Westman, and compares Jenkins' diet to a low-carb, high-fat ketogenic diet, and look at the results he gets there. Far greater improvements on the low-carb, high-fat diet than the low-GI diet. Now, last year, for the first time in history, I was invited to lecture at the Canadian Diabetes Association meeting, and I put up this slide, and I said, WTF, you know, like... And I didn't get invited back. I didn't get invited back. So I, I think I'm going to have to wrap up soon. Uh, I'm going to show you a case study. This is one of my First Nations friends from up near where we did the study. <clears throat> He's my poster boy. He lets me tell his story, show his picture. He was a 48-year-old First Nations man, well-educated, been to college, was a leader, political leader, had chronic, had, he had the whole package, uh, diabetes, uh, metabolic syndrome, he had hypertension, dyslipidemia, he'd already had a stroke, he was only 48 years old. He'd been on insulin for 17 years, uh, lots of insulin, he was on Ramipril for his blood pressure, he was, the doctor was trying to get him on a statin, but he hadn't started that. His fasting glucose was 9 and 10, that's like, well, we're in Austin, we're, what, what country, are, uh, 9 and 10, does that make sense to you here? Okay. 5, five to 6 would be. Yeah, five, 6 would be the upper limit of normal. Uh, his weight was... High. He's, a, he's not a very tall man. He had a very high BMI. And the, the interesting thing about him was I gave a talk to an audience in a little health conference. He heard a one-hour talk, and he said, I'm going to do this. He went back to his community, went, checked in his health center, got weighed and measured and so on. And then he started sending me uh, emails. <clears throat> First email, two weeks, weight loss, 17 pounds, normal blood sugar, no insulin within two weeks. 17 years struggling with insulin, not getting normal blood sugar. Now he's on no insulin and normal blood sugar. At four weeks, he's lost 31 pounds, ditches the ACE inhibitor, he's, he's uh, uh, got normal blood pressure now. At nine weeks, 37 pounds weight loss, lovely blood pressure, normal fasting sugars. 18 weeks, I took this photo, he's lost 46 pounds, Normal blood sugar, normal blood pressure, he's got his lipids checked, everything is fine. He's on no medication. He's still obese, but he's metabolically normal after only 18 weeks. And I used to show these slides and people say, yeah, of course, anybody can do that. It works in the short term, but nobody can stay on that horrible restrictive diet. Well, he sent me this picture. This is seven years out. He's lost another 50 pounds. In the seven years, and he's on no medication, in the seven years, he's had a couple relapses. And this is fascinating. He says he'll play around a golf, and uh, somebody will say, uh, have a slice of pizza and a beer. And then he's off on a binge, a carbohydrate binge. 
he's chronically hungry, he starts eating carbs, he can't stop, gains weight, his markers go sideways, and then he gives his head a shake, gets off the carbs, and everything goes back to normal. And that's happened twice in that seven-year interval. Now, the fascinating thing about that was I had an old-fashioned medical education. We had a lecture on how you diagnose a food intolerance. That's how you diagnose a food intolerance. He has an intolerance to carbohydrates. If he eats them, he gets into all kinds of trouble. If he doesn't eat them, he is fine. Now, in our medical practice, what other food intolerance do we recommend that you eat half your diet from the foods you can't tolerate? What I tell my patients is, when you're a diabetic, you have two options. You can follow the guidelines, continue to eat the foods you can no longer tolerate, and take a bunch of medications and insulin and whatever to try and make that okay. Or you can stop eating the foods you don't tolerate and get these kinds of results. Um, so the Ulic in Greece, the question was, why did they go to all that trouble? Now, by now, you're probably under, not surprised to hear that I think we were meant to burn fat as our primary fuel, not glucose. And if fat is our primary fuel, it stands to reason that when we store our fuel as fat for later use, we would store it in the combination that makes sense in terms of fatty acid profile. The, 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 the preferred fatty acid profile would be the fat that we store. When we analyzed the ulican grease, we sent it down to lab of Doug Beavis in, uh, in Minnesota. When they did the analysis, they sent back the report, they said this is a remarkable food item. It's the closest thing we've seen in fatty acid profile to human adipose. So this ancient culture, who burn fat as their primary energy source, figured out somehow, without a gas chromatograph, that the fat in that one little fish was the ideal fat for human consumption because it so closely resembled human adipose in its fatty acid profile. 